Section 15 of Catherine de' Medici by Honor de Balzac. Translated by Catherine Prescott Warmly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13. Calvin. Two hours later all was ready, and the ardent minister was on his way to Switzerland, accompanied by a nobleman in the service of the King of Navarre, with whom Chaudieu pretended to be the secretary, carrying with him dispatches from the reformers in the Dauphin. His sudden departure was chiefly in the interests of Catherine de' Medici, who, in order to gain time to establish her power, had made a bold proposition to the reformers which was kept a profound secret. This strange proceeding explains the understanding so suddenly apparent between herself and the leaders of the reform. The wily woman gave, as a pledge of her good faith, an intimation of her desire to heal all differences between the two churches by calling an assembly, which should be neither a council nor a conclave nor a synod, but should be known by some new and distinctive name if calvin consented to the project when this secret was afterwards divulged be it remarked in passing it led to an alliance between the duc de guise and the connetable de montmorency against catherine and the king of navarre a strange alliance known in history as a triumvirate the marquis de saint andre being the third personage in the purely catholic coalition in which this singular proposition for a colloquy gave rise the secret of Catherine's wily policy was rightly understood by the Guises. They felt certain that the Queen cared nothing for this mysterious assembly, and was only temporising with her new allies in order to secure a period of peace until the majority of Charles the Ninth. But none the less did they receive the Connetable, interfering a collusion of real interests between the Queen and the Bourbons, whereas in reality Catherine was playing them all one against another. Queen had become, as the reader will perceive, extremely powerful in a very short time. The spirit of discussion and controversy which now sprang up was singularly favourable to her position. The Catholics and the Reformers were equally pleased to exhibit their brilliancy, one after another, in this tournament of words, for that is what it actually was, and no more. It is extraordinary that historians have mistaken one of the wiliest schemes of the great Queen for uncertainty and hesitation. Catherine never went more directly to her own ends than in just such schemes which appeared to thwart them. The King of Navarre, quite incapable of understanding her motives, fell into her plan in all sincerity, and dispatched Chaudieu to Calvin, as we have seen. The minister had risked his life to be secretly in Orléans and watch events, for he was, while there in hourly peril of being discovered, and hung as a man under sentence of banishment. According to the then fashion of travelling, Chaudieu would not reach Geneva before the month of February, and the negotiations were not likely to be concluded before the end of March. Consequently, the assembly could certainly not take place before the month of May 1561. Catherine, meantime, intended to amuse the court and the various conflicting interests by the coronation of the king in the ceremonies of his first de de justice, at which l'hôpital and de Thou recorded the letters patent by which charles the ninth confided the administration to his mother in common with the present lieutenant-general of the kingdom antoine de navarre the weakest prince of those days is it not a strange spectacle this of the great kingdom of france waiting in suspense for the yes or no of a french burgher hitherto an obscure man living for many years past in geneva the transalpine pope held in check by the pontiff of geneva the two lorraine princes lately all powerful now paralyzed by the momentary coalition of the queen mother and the first prince of the blood with calvin is not this i say one of the most instructive lessons ever given to kings by history a lesson which should teach them to study men to seek out genius and employ it as did louis the fourteenth wherever god has placed it Calvin, whose name was not Calvin, but Corvin, was the son of a cooper at Noyon in Picardy. The region of his birth explains in some degree the obstinacy combined with capricious eagerness which distinguished this arbiter of the destinies of France in the 16th century. Nothing is less known than the nature of this man, who gave birth to Geneva and to the spirit that emanated from that city. 
Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who had very little historical knowledge, has completely ignored the influence of Calvin on his republic. At first, the embryo reformer who lived in one of the humblest houses in the upper town, near the church of Saint-Pierre, over a carpenter's shop, first resemblance between him and Robespierre, had no great authority in Geneva. In fact, for a long time, his power was malevolently checked by the Genovese. The town was the residence in those days of a citizen whose fame, like that of several others, remained unknown to the world at large, and for a time to Geneva itself. This man, Farrell, about the year 1537, detained Calvin in Geneva, pointing out to him that the place could be made the safe centre of a reformation more active and thorough than that of Luther. Farrell and Calvin regarded Lutheranism as an incomplete work, insufficient in itself, and without any real grip upon France. Geneva, midway between France and Italy, and speaking the French language, was admirably situated for ready communication with Germany, France, and Italy. Calvin thereupon adopted Geneva as the site of his moral fortunes. He made it thenceforth the citadel of his ideas. The Council of Geneva, at Fowles and Treaty, authorized Calvin in September 1538 to give lectures on theology. Calvin left the duties of the ministry to Farrell, his first disciple, and gave himself up patiently to the work of teaching his doctrine. His authority, which became so absolute in the last years of his life, was obtained with difficulty and very slowly. The great agitator met with such serious obstacles that he was banished for a time from Geneva on account of the severity of his reform. A party of honest citizens still clung to their old luxury and their old customs, but as usually happens, these good people, fearing ridicule, would not admit the real object of their efforts, and kept up their warfare against the new doctrines on points altogether foreign to the real question. Calvin insisted that leavened bread should be used for the communion, and that all feasts should be abolished except Sundays. These innovations were disapproved of at Bern and at Lausanne. A notice was served on the Genovese to conform to the ritual of Switzerland. Calvin and Farrell resisted. Their political opponents used this disobedience to drive them from Geneva, whence they were in fact banished for several years. Later, Calvin returned triumphantly the demand of his flock. Such persecutions always become, in the end, the consecration of a moral power, and in this case Calvin's return was the beginning of his era as prophet. He then organized his religious terror, and the executions began. On his reappearance in the city, he was admitted into the ranks of the Genovese burghers, but even then, after fourteen years' residence, he was not made a member of the council. At the time of which we write, when Catherine sent her envoy to him, this king of ideas had no other title than that of pastor of the Church of Geneva. Moreover, Calvin never in his life received a salary of more than 150 francs in money yearly, 1,500 weight of wheat, and two barrels of wine. His brother, a tailor, kept a shop close to the Place Saint-Pierre in a street now occupied by one of the large printing establishments of Geneva. Such personal disinterestedness, which was lacking in Voltaire, Newton, and Bacon, and eminent in the lives of Rabelais, Spinoza, Loyola, Kant, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, is indeed a magnificent frame for those ardent and sublime figures. The career of Robespierre can alone picture to the minds of the present day that of Calvin, who, founding his power on the same bases, was as despotic and as cruel as the lawyer of Arras. It is a notable fact that Picardy, Arras, and Noyon furnished both these instruments of reformation. Persons who wish to study the motives of the executions ordered by Calvin will find all relations considered. Another, 1793, in Geneva. Calvin cut off the head of Jacques Croix for having written impious letters, libertine verses, and for working to overthrow ecclesiastical ordinances. Reflect upon that sentence, and ask yourselves if the worst tyrants in their Saturnalias ever gave more horribly burlesque reasons for their cruelties. Valentin Gentilly, condemned to death for involuntary heresy, escaped execution only by making a submission far more ignominious than was ever imposed by the Catholic Church. 
seven years before the conference which was now to take place in Calvin's house on the proposals of the queen mother michel Servet, a frenchman travelling through switzerland was arrested at geneva tried condemned and burned alive on calvin's accusation for having attacked the mystery of the trinity in a book which was neither written nor published in geneva remember the eloquent remonstrance of jean jacques rousseau whose book overthrowing the catholic religion written in france and published in holland was burned by the hangman while the author a foreigner was merely banished from the kingdom where he had endeavoured to destroy the fundamental proofs of religion and of authority compare the conduct of our parliament with that of the genovese tyrant again bolsay was brought to trial for having other ideas than those of calvin on predestination consider these things and ask yourself if fouquier tinville did worse the savage religious intolerance of calvin was morally speaking more implacable than the savage political intolerance of robespierre on a larger stage than that of geneva calvin would have shed more blood than did the terrible apostle of political equality as opposed to catholic equality three centuries earlier a monk of picardy drove the whole west upon the east peter the hermit calvin and robespierre each at an interval of three hundred years and all three from the same region were politically speaking the archimedean screws of their age at each epoch a thought which found its fulcrum in the self-interest of mankind calvin was undoubtedly the maker of that melancholy town called geneva where only ten years ago a man said pointing to a port cochere in the upper town the first ever built there by that door luxury has invaded geneva Calvin gave birth, by the sternness of his doctrines and his executions, to that form of hypocritical sentiment called Kant. According to those who practice it, good morals consist in renouncing the arts and the charms of life, in eating richly but without luxury, in silently amassing money without enjoying it, otherwise than as Calvin enjoyed power by thought calvin imposed on all the citizens of his adopted town the same gloomy pall which he spread over his own life he created in the consistory a calvinistic inquisition absolutely similar to the revolutionary tribunal of robespierre the consistory denounced the persons to be condemned to the council and calvin ruled the council through the consistory just as robespierre ruled the convention through the club of the jacobin in this way an eminent magistrate of geneva was condemned to two months imprisonment the loss of all his offices and the right of ever attaining others because he had led a disorderly life and was intimate with calvin's enemies calvin thus became a legislator he created the austere sober commonplace and hideously sad but irreproachable manners and customs which characterize geneva to the present day customs preceding those of england called puritanism which were due to the cameronians disciples of cameron frenchman deriving his doctrine from calvin whom sir walter scott depicts so admirably the poverty of a man a sovereign master who negotiated power to power with kings demanding armies and subsidies and plunging both hands into their savings laid aside for the unfortunate proves that thought used solely as a means of domination gives birth to political misers men who enjoy by their brains only and like the jesuits want power for power's sake pitt luther calvin robespierre all those harpagons of power died without a penny the inventory taken in calvin's house after his death which comprised all his property even his books amounted in value as history records to two hundred and fifty francs that of luther came to about the same sum his widow the famous catherine de bora was forced to petition for a pension of five hundred francs which is granted to her by an elector of germany potemkin Richelieu, mazarin those men of thought and action all three of whom made or laid the foundation of empires each left over three hundred millions behind them they had hearts they loved women and the arts they built they conquered whereas with the exception of the wife of luther the home of that iliad 
all the others had no tenderness no beating of the heart for any woman with which to reproach themselves this brief digression was necessary in order to explain calvin's position in geneva during the first days of the month of february in the year fifteen sixty one on a soft warm evening such as we may sometimes find of that season on lake la Main, two horsemen arrived at the Pre l'eveque thus called because it was the former country place of the bishop of geneva driven from switzerland about thirty years earlier these horsemen who no doubt knew the laws of geneva about the closing of the gates then a necessity and now very ridiculous rode in the direction of the port de rive but they stopped their horses suddenly on catching sight of a man about fifty years of age leaning on the arm of a servant woman and walking slowly toward the town this man who was rather stout walked with difficulty putting one foot after the other with pain apparently for he wore round shoes of black velvet laced in front it is he says chaudieu to the other horseman who immediately dismounted threw the reins to his companion and went forward opening wide his arms to the man on foot the man who was jean calvin drew back to avoid the embrace casting a stern look at his disciple at fifty years of age calvin looked as though he was sixty stout and stocky in figure he seemed shorter still because the horrible sufferings of stone in the bladder obliged him to bend almost double as he walked these pains were complicated by attacks of gout of the worst kind every one trembled before that face almost as broad as it was long on which in spite of its roundness there was as little human kindness as that on henry the eighth whom calvin greatly resembled sufferings which gave him no respite were manifest in the deep cut lines starting from each side of the nose and following the curve of the moustache till they were lost in a thick grey beard this face though red and inflamed like that of a heavy drinker showed spots where the skin was yellow in spite of the velvet cap which covered the huge square head a vast forehead of noble shape could be seen and admired beneath it shone two dark eyes which must have flashed forth flame in moments of anger whether by reason of his obesity or because of his thick short neck or in consequence of his vigils and his constant labours calvin's head was sunk between his broad shoulders which obliged him to wear a fluted ruff of very small dimensions on which his face seemed to lie like the head of john the baptist on a charger between his moustache and his beard could be seen like a rose his small and fresh and eloquent little mouth shaped in perfection the face was divided by a square nose remarkable for the inflexibility of its entire length the tip of which was significantly flat seeming more in harmony with the prodigious power expressed by the form of that imperial head though it might have been difficult to discover on his features any trace of the weekly headaches which tormented calvin in the intervals of the slow fever that consumed him suffering ceaselessly resisted by study and by will gave to that mask superficially so florid a certain something that was terrible perhaps this impression was explainable by the colour of a sort of greasy lay on the skin due to the sedentary habits of the toiler showing evidence of the perpetual struggle which went on between that valetudinarian temperament and one of the strongest wills ever known in the history of the human mind the mouth though charming had an expression of cruelty chastity necessitated by vast designs exacted by so many sickly conditions was written upon that face regrets were there notwithstanding the serenity of that all-powerful brow together with pain in the glance of those eyes the calmness of which was terrifying calvin's costume brought into full relief this powerful head he wore the well-known cassock of black cloth fastened round his waist by a black cloth belt with a brass buckle which became thenceforth the distinctive dress of all calvinist ministers and was so uninteresting to the eye that it forced the spectator's attention upon the wearer's face i suffer too much theodore to embrace you said calvin to the elegant cavalier theodore de bez when forty-two years of age and lately admitted at calvin's request as a genovese burgher formed a violent contrast to the terrible pastor 
whom he had chosen as his sovereign guide and ruler. Calvin, like all burghers raised to moral sovereignty, and all inventors of social systems, was eaten up with jealousy. He abhorred his disciples. He wanted no equals. He could not bear the slightest contradiction. Yet there was between him and this graceful cavalier so marked a difference. Theodore de Beers was gifted with so charming a personality, enhanced by a politeness trained by court life, and Calvin felt him to be so unlike his other surly janissaries, that the stern reformer departed in de Beers's case from his usual habits. He never loved him, but this harsh legislator totally ignored all friendship. But not fearing him in the light of a successor, he liked to play with Theodore as Hoshilu played with his cat. He found him supple and agile. Seeing how admirably de Beers succeeded in all his missions, he took a fancy to the polished instrument of which he knew himself the mainspring and the manipulator. So true is it that the sternest of men can't do without some semblance of affection. Theodore was Calvin's spoilt child. The harsh reformer never scolded him. He forgave him his dissipations, his amours, his fine clothes, and his elegance of language. Perhaps Calvin was not unwilling to show that the Reformation had a few men of the world to compare with the men of the court. Theodore de Bez was anxious to introduce a taste for the arts, for literature, and for poesy into Geneva, and Calvin listened to his plans without knitting his thick grey eyebrows. Thus the contrast of character and person between these two celebrated men was as complete and marked as the difference in their minds. Calvin acknowledged Chaudieu's very humble salutation by a slight inclination of the head. Chaudieu slipped the bridles of both horses through his arms and followed the two great men of the Reformation, walking to the left, behind de Bez, who was on Calvin's right. The servant woman hastened on in advance to prevent the closing of the Porte de Rive by informing the captain of the guard that Calvin had been seized with sudden acute pains. Theodore de Bez was a native of the canton of Vézelay, which was the first to enter the Confederation, the curious history of which transaction has been written by one of the Thierrys. The burghish spirit of resistance, endemic at Vézelay, no doubt, played its part in the person of this man in the great revolt of the reformers. But de Bez was undoubtedly one of the most singular personalities of the heresy. You suffer still, said Theodore to Calvin, Catholic would say, like a lost soul, replied the reformer, with the bitterness he gave to his slightest remarks. Ah, I shall not be here long, my son. What will become of you without me? We shall fight by the light of your books, said Chaudieu. Calvin smiled, his red face changed to a pleased expression, and he looked favourably at Chaudieu. Well, have you brought me news? Have they massacred many of our people? he said, smiling and letting a sarcastic joy shine in his brown eyes. No, said Chaudieu, all is peaceful. So much the worse, cried Calvin, so much the worse. All pacification is an evil, if indeed it is not the trap. Our strength lies in persecution. Where should we be if the church accepted reform? But, said Theodore, that is precisely what the Queen Mother appears to wish. She is capable of it, remarked Calvin. I study that woman. But at this distance? Is there any distance for the mind? replied Calvin sternly, for he thought the interruption irreverent. Catherine seeks power, and women with that in their eye have neither honour nor faith. But what is she doing now? I bring you a proposal from her to call a species of council, replied Theodore de Beers. Near Paris? asked Calvin hastily. Yes. Ha! So much the better, exclaimed the reformer. We are trying to understand each other, then draw up some public agreement which shall unite the two churches. Ah! If you would only have the courage to separate the French church from the court of Rome and create a patriarch for France, as she did in the Greek church, cried Calvin, his eyes glistening at the idea thus presented to his mind 
of a possible throne but my son can the niece of a pope be sincere she is only trying to gain time she has sent away the queen of scots said chaudier one less remarked calvin as they passed through the port de vive elizabeth of england will restrain that one for us two neighbouring queens will soon be at war with each other one is handsome the other ugly a first cause for irritation besides this is a question of illegitimacy he rubbed his hands and the character of his joy was so evidently ferocious that de Beers shuddered he saw the sea of blood his master was contemplating the guises have irritated the house of bourbon said theodore after a pause they came to upon rupture at orleans ah said calvin you would not believe me my son when i told you the last time you started from the rack that we should end by striking up war to the death between the two branches of the house of france i have at least one court one king and royal family on my side my doctrine is producing its effect upon the masses the burghers too understand me they regard as idolaters all who go to mass who paint the walls of their churches and put pictures and statues with them ah it is far more easy for people to demolish churches and palaces than to argue the question of justification by faith or the real presence lucifer was an argufier but i i am an army he was a reasoner i am a system in short my sons he was merely a skirmisher but i am tarquin yes my faithful shall destroy pictures and pull down churches they shall make millstones of statues to grind the flour of the peoples there are guilds and corporations in the states general and you will have nothing there but individuals corporations resist they see clear where the masses are blind we must join to our doctrine political interests which will consolidate it and keep together the material of my armies i have satisfied the logic of cautious souls and the minds of thinkers by this bad and naked worship which carries religion into the world of ideas i have made the peoples understand the advantages of suppressing ceremony it is for you theodore to enlist their interests hold to that go not beyond it all is said in the way of doctrine let no one add one iota why does cameron that little gascon pastor who presume to write of it calvin de Bez and Chaudier were mounting the steep steps of the upper town in the midst of a crowd but the crowd paid not the slightest attention to the men who were unchaining the mobs of other cities and preparing them to ravage france after this terrible tirade the three marched on in silence till they entered the little place saint pierre and turned toward the pastor's house on the second story of that house never noted and which of these days no one has ever told in geneva where it may be remarked calvin has no stature his lodging consisted of three chambers with common pine floors and wainscots at the end of which were the kitchen and the bedroom of his woman servant the entrance as usually happened in most of the burgher households in geneva was through the kitchen which opened into a little room with two windows serving as parlour salon and dining room calvin's study where his thought had wrestled with suffering for the last fourteen years came next with the bedroom beyond it four oaken chairs covered with tapestry and placed around a square table were the sole furniture of the parlour a stove of white porcelain standing in one corner of the room cast out a gentle heat panels and a wainscot of pine wood left in its natural state without decoration covered the wall thus the nakedness of the place was in keeping with the sober and simple life of the reformer well said de Bez as they entered profiting by a few moments which chaudier left them to put up the horse at a neighbouring inn what am i to do will you agree to the colloquy of course replied Carl. and it is you my son you would fight for us there be peremptory be arbitrary no one neither the queen nor the guises nor i wants a pacification it would not suit us at all i have confidence in duplessis monet let him play the leading part are we alone he added with a glance of distrust into the kitchen where two shirts and a few collars were stretched on a line to dry go and shut all the doors well he continued when theodore had returned we must drive the king of navarre to join the guises and the connetable by advising them to break with queen catherine de medici let us all get the benefit of that poor creature's 
weakness. If he turns against the Italians, she will, when she sees herself deprived of that support, necessarily unite with the Prince de Conde and Coligny. Perhaps this manoeuvre will so compromise her that she will be forced to remain on her side. Theodore de Beers caught the hem of Calvo's cassock and kissed it. Oh, my master, he exclaimed, how great you are. Unfortunately, my dear Theodore, I am dying. If I die without seeing you again, yet sinking his voice and speaking in the ear of his minister of foreign affairs, remember to strike a great blow by the hand of some one of our martyrs. Another mina to be killed, something better than a mere lawyer. A king, still better, a man who wants to be a king. Du de Guise, exclaimed Theodore with an involuntary gesture. Well, cried Calvin, who thought he saw disappointment or resistance in the gesture, and did not see at the same moment the entrance of Chaudieu. Have we not the right to strike as we are struck? Yes, to strike in silence and in darkness. May we not return the wound for wound and death for death? Would the Catholics hesitate to lay traps for us and massacre us? Assuredly not. Let us burn their churches. Forward, my children, and if you have devoted youths. I have, said Chaudieu. Use them as engines of war. Our cause justifies all means. The Balafoy's horrible soldier is like me more than a man. He is a dynasty, just as I am a system. He is able to annihilate us. Therefore I say, death to the Guise. I would rather have a peaceful victory, won by time and reason, said the Bears. Time! exclaimed Calvin, dashing his chair to the ground. Reason! You mad! Can reason achieve conquests? You know nothing of men, you deal with them, idiot. The thing that injures my doubt in you, triple fool, is the reason that is in it. By the lightning of soul, by the sword of vengeance, thou pumpkin head, do you not see the vigour given to me by reform, by the massacre at Amboise? Ideas never grow till they are watered with blood. The slaying of the Duc de Guise will lead to horrible persecution, and I pray for it with all my might. Our reverses are preferable to success. The Reformation has an object to gain in being attacked. Do you hear me? Don't. It cannot hurt us to be defeated, whereas Catholicism is at an end if we should win but a single battle. Ha! What are my lieutenants? Rags. Wet rags instead of men. White-haired cravens. Baptist. Apes. Oh, God, grant me ten years more of life. If I die too soon, the cause of true religion is lost in the hands of such boobies. You are as great a fool as Antoine de Navarre. Out of my sight, leave me. I want a better negotiator than you. You're an ass, a popinje, a poet. Go and make your elegies and your acoustics, you trifler. Hence. The pains of his body were absolutely overcome by the fire of his anger. Even the gout subsided under this horrible excitement of his mind. Calvin's face flushed purple, like the sky before a storm. His vast brow shone. His eyes flamed. He was no longer himself. He gave way utterly to the species of epileptic motion, full of passion, which was common with him. But in the very midst of it, he was struck by the attitude of the two witnesses. Then, as he caught the words of Chaudieu saying to de Beres of the burning bush, he sat down, burned, and covered his face with his two hands, the knotted veins of which were throbbing in spite of their coarse texture. Some minutes later, still shaken by the storm raised within him by the continence of his life, he said in a voice of emotion, my sins, which are many, cost me less trouble to subdue than my impatience. Savage beast, should I never vanquish you, he cried, beating his breast. My dear master, said de Bez in a tender voice, taking Calvin's hand and kissing it. Jupiter thunders, but he knows how to smile. Calvin looked at his disciple with a softened eye and said, Understand me, my friend. I understand that the pastors of peoples bear great burdens, replied Theodore. You are a world upon your shoulders. I have three martyrs, said Chaudieu, whom the master's outburst had rendered thoughtful, on whom we can rely. Stuart to give Minard is at liberty. You are mistaken, said Calvin gently, smiling after the manner of a great man who brings fair weather into their faces as though they were ashamed of their previous storm. I know human nature. Man may kill one president, but not two. Is it absolutely necessary? asked de Bez. Again, exclaimed Calvin, his nostrils swelling. Come, leave me. 
will drive me to fury. Take my decision to the queen. You shall your go your way and hold your flock together in Paris. God guide you. Dagger, let my friends to the door. Do you not permit me to embrace you? said Theodore, much moved. Who knows what may happen to us on the morrow? We may be seized in spite of our safe conduct. And yet you want to spare them, cried Calvin, embracing the bears. Then he took Chaudier's hand and said, Above all, no Huguenots, no reformers, but Calvinists. Use no term but Calvinism. Alas, this is not ambition, for I am dying. But it is necessary to destroy the whole of Luther, even to the name of Lutheran and Lutheranism. Ah, man divine, cried Chaudier, you well deserve such honours. Maintain the uniformity of the doctrine. Let no one henceforth change or remark it. We are now lost if new sex issue from our bosom. We will here anticipate the events on which this study is based, and close the history of Theodore de Bez, who went to Paris with Chaudieu. It is to be remarked that Paul Torre, who fired at the Duc de Guise fifteen months later, confessed under torture that he had been urged to the crime by Theodore de Bez, though he retracted the avowal during subsequent tortures, so that Bossuet, after weighing all historical considerations, felt obliged to acquit Bez of investigating the crime. Since Bossuet's time, however, an apparently futile dissertation, apropos of a celebrated song, has led a compiler of the 18th century to prove that the verses on the death of the Duc de Guise, sung by the Huguenots, from one end of France to the other, was the work of Théodore de Bez. And it is also proved that the famous song on the burial of Marlborough was plagiarism on it. One of the most remarkable instances of the transmission of songs is that of Marlborough written in the first instance by Huguenot on the death of the Duc de Guise in 1563. It was preserved in the French army and appears to have been sung with variations, suppressions and additions at the death of all generals of importance. When the intestine wars were over, the song followed the soldiers into civil life. It was never forgotten, though the habit of singing it may have lessened, and in 1781, sixty years after the death of Marlborough, the wet nurse of the Dauphin was heard to sing it as she suckled her nursling. When a wider name of the Duke of Marlborough was substituted for that of the Duc de Guise has never been ascertained. See Chanson Populaire par Charles Nizar, Paris Dantou, 1867. End of section 15. Section 16 of Catherine de' Medici by Honor de Balzac. Translated by Catherine Prescott Woolman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book One, Chapter Fourteen, Catherine in Power. The day on which Theodore de Beers and Chaudieu arrived in Paris, the court returned from Rheims, where Charles the Ninth was crowned. This ceremony, which Catherine made magnificent with splendid fates, enabled her to gather about her the leaders of the various parties. Having studied all interests and all factions, she found herself with two alternatives on which to choose, either to rally them all to the throne or to pit them one against the other. The Connetable de Montmorency, supremely Catholic, whose nephew, the Prince de Conde, was leader of the reformers and whose sons were inclined to the new religion, blamed the alliance of the Queen Mother with the Reformation. The Guises on the other side were endeavouring to gain over Antoine de Bourbon King of Navarre, a weak prince, a manoeuvre which his wife, Jeanne d'Albret, instructed by de Bez, allowed to succeed. The difficulties were plain to Catherine, whose dawning power needed a period of tranquillity. She therefore impatiently awaited Calvin's reply to the message which the Prince de Conde, the King of Navarre, Coligny d'Andelu, and the Cardinal de Chatillon had sent them through de Bez and Chaudieu. Meantime, however, she was faithful to her promises as to the Prince de Conde. The Chancellor put an end to the proceedings in which Christophe was involved by referring the affair to the Parliament of Paris, which at once set aside the judgment of the committee, declaring it without power to try a prince of the blood. The Parliament then reopened the trial at the request of the Guises, and the Queen Mother, 
Lasagna's papers had already been given to Catherine, who burned them. The giving up of these papers was a first pledge, uselessly made by the Guises to the Queen Mother. The Parliament, no longer able to take cognizance of those decisive proofs, reinstated the prince in all his rights, property, and honours. Christophe, released during the tumult at Orléans on the death of the king, was acquitted in the first instance, and appointed, in compensation for his sufferings, solicitor to the Parliament at the request of his godfather, Monsieur de Thu. Triumvirate, that coming coalition of self-interests threatened by Catherine's first acts, was now forming itself under her very eyes. Just as in chemistry, antagonistic substances separate at the first shock which jars their enforced union, so in politics the alliance of opposing interests never lasts. Catherine thoroughly understood that sooner or later she should return to the Guises and combine with them in the Connetable to do battle against the Huguenots. The proposed colloquy, which tempted the vanity of the orators of all parties, and offered an imposing spectacle to succeed that of the coronation and enliven the bloody ground of a religious war which, in point of fact, had already begun, was as futile in the eyes of the Duc de Guise as in those of Catherine. The Catholics would, in one sense, be worsted, for the Huguenots, under pretext of conferring, would be able to proclaim their doctrine, the sanction of the king and his mother, to the ears of all France. Cardinal de Lorraine, flattered by Catherine into the idea of destroying the heresy by the eloquence of the church, persuaded his brother to consent, and thus the queen obtained what was all essential to her, six months of peace. A slight event occurring at this time came near compromising the power which Catherine had so painfully built up. The following scene, preserved in history, took place on the very day the envoys returned from Geneva in the Hôtel de Coligny near the Louvre. At his coronation, Charles the Ninth, who was greatly attached to his tutor, Amiot, appointed him Grand Almoner of France. This affection was shared by his brother, the Duc d'Anjou, afterwards Henri the Third, another of Anjou's pupils. Catherine heard the news of this appointment from the two Gondis during the journey from Reims to Paris. She had counted on that office in the gift of the crown to gain a supporter in the church with whom to oppose the Cardinal de Lorraine. Her choice had fallen on the Cardinal de Tournon, in whom she expected to find, as in L'Hôpital, another crutch, the word his own. As soon as she reached the Louvre, she sent for the tutor, and her anger was such on seeing the disaster to her policy caused by the ambition of this son of a shoemaker that she was betrayed into using the following extraordinary language, which several memoirs of the day have handed down to us. What? she cried. Am I who compel the Guises, the Colonies, the Connetable, the House of Navarre, the Prince of de Conde, to serve my ends? Am I to be opposed by a priestling like you, who are not satisfied to be Bishop of Azaire? Amiel excused himself. He assured the Queen that he had asked nothing. The King of his own will had been given him the office of which he, the son of a poor tailor, felt himself quite unworthy. Be assured, Metor, replied Catherine, that being the name which the two kings, Charles the Ninth and Henri the Third, gave to the great writer, that you'll not stand on your feet twenty-four hours hence unless you make your pupil change his mind. Between the death thus threatened and the resignation of the highest ecclesiastical office in the gift of the crown, the son of the shoemaker, who had lately become extremely eager after honours, and may even have coveted a cardinal's hat, thought it prudent to temporise. He left the court and hid himself in the abbey of Saint Germain. When Charles the Ninth did not see him at his first dinner, he asked where he was. Some Guizar doubtless told him of what had occurred between Amiot and the Queen Mother. Has he been forced to disappear because I made him condom there? cried the king. He thereupon rushed to his mother in the violent wrath of angry children when their caprices are opposed. Madame, he said on entering, did I not kindly sign the letter you asked me to send to Parliament, by means of which you govern my kingdom? Did you not promise that if I did so, my will should be yours, and here the first favour that I wish to bestow excites your jealousy? The Chancellor talks of declaring my majority at fourteen. 
three years from now, and you wish to treat me as a child. By God, I will be king, and as king as my father and grandfather were kings. The tone and manner in which these words were said gave Catherine a revelation of her son's true character. It was like a blow in the breast. He speaks to me thus, him who I made king, she thought. Monsieur, she said aloud, the office of a king. In times like these, is a very difficult one. You do not yet know the shrewd men with whom you have to deal. You will never have a safer and more sincere friend than your mother, or better servants than those who have been so long attached to her person, without whose services you might perhaps not even exist today. The Guises want both your life and your throne, be sure of that. If they could sew me into a sack and fling me to the river, she said, pointing to the Seine, it would be done tonight. They know that I am a lioness defending her young, and that I alone prevent their daring hands from seizing your crown. To whom, to whose party does your tutor belong? Who are his allies? What authority has he? What services he can do you? What weight do his words carry? Instead of finding a prop to sustain your power, you have cut the ground from under it. The Cardinal de Lorraine is a living threat to you. He plays the king. He keeps his hat on his head before the princes of the blood. It was urgently necessary to invest another cardinal with powers greater than his one. But what have you done? Is Amiot that shoemaker fit only to tie the ribbons of his shoes? Is he capable of making head against the Guise ambition? However, you love Amiot. You have appointed him. Your will must now be done, monsieur. But before you make such gifts again, I pray you to consult me in affection of good faith. Listen to reasons of state, and your own good sense as a child may perhaps agree with my old experience when you really understand the difficulties that lay before you. Then I can have my master back again, cried the king, not listening to his mother's words, which he considered to be mere reproaches. Yes, you shall have him, she replied, but it is not here, nor that brutal cipier who will teach you how to reign. It is for you to do so, my dear mother, said the boy, mollified by his victory, and relaxing the surly and threatening look stamped by nature upon his countenance. Catherine sent Gondi to recall the new Grand Ormonaire. When the Italian discovered the place of Amiel's retreat, and the bishop heard that the courtier was sent by the queen, he was seized with terror and refused to leave the abbey. In this extremity, Catherine was obliged to write to him herself, in such terms that he returned to Paris and received from her own lips the assurance of her protection, on condition, however, that he would blindly promote her wishes with Charles the Ninth. This little domestic tempest over, the queen, now re-established in the Louvre after an absence of more than a year, held counsel with her closest friends as to the proper conduct to pursue with the young king whom Scipio had complimented on his firmness. "'What is best to be done?' she said to the two Gondis, Ruggiero, Viraggio, and Giverni, who had lately become governor and chancellor to the Duc d'Anjou. "'Before all else,' replied Virago, "'get rid of Scipio. He is not a courtier. He will never accommodate himself to your ideas, and will think he does his duty in thwarting you. Whom can I trust? cried the queen. One of us, said Barago. On my honour, exclaimed Gondi, I'll promise you to make the king as docile as the king of Navarre. You allow the king to perish to save your other children, said Albert de Gondi. Do then as the great seigneurs of Constantinople do. Divert the anger and amuse the caprices of the present king. He loves art and poetry and hunting. Also a little girl is at Orléans. There's occupation enough for him. Will you really be the king's governor? said Catherine to the ablest of the Gondis. Yes, if you will give me the necessary authority. You may even be obliged to make me Marshal of France and the Duke. Sibia is altogether too small a man to hold the office. In the future, the governor of the king of France should be of some great dignity, like that of duke or marshal. 
he is right said Birago. poet and huntsman said catherine in a dreamy tone we will hunt and make love cried gondi moreover remarked Kiverni, you are sure of amyot who will always fear poison in case of disobedience so that you and he and gondi can hold the king in the leading strings Amyo has deeply offended me said catherine he does not know what he owes to you if he did know you would be in danger replied birago gravely emphasizing his words then it is agreed exclaimed catherine on whom birago's reply made a powerful impression that you gondi are to be the king's governor my son must consent to do for one of my friends a favour equal to the one i have just permitted for his knave of a bishop that fool has lost the hat for never as long as i live will i consent that the pope shall give it to him how strong he might have been with cardinal de tenon what a trio with tonon the grand almoner and l'hôpital and de Tour. as for the burghers of paris i intend to make my son cajole them we will get a separate we will get a support there accordingly albert de gondi became a marshal of france and was created duc de retz and governor of the king a few days later at the moment when this little private council ended cardinal de tournon announced to the queen the arrival of the emissaries sent to calvin admiral coligny accompanied the party in order that his presence might ensure them due respect at the louvre the queen gathered the formidable phalanx of her maids of honour about her and passed into the reception hall built by her husband which no longer exists in the louvre of today at the period of which we write the staircase of the louvre occupied the clock tower catherine's apartments were in the old buildings which still exist in the court of the musee the present staircase of the museum was built in what was formerly the salle de ballet the ballet of those days was a sort of dramatic entertainment performed by the whole court revolutionary passions gave rise to a most laughable error about charles the ninth in connection with the louvre during the revolution hostile opinions as to this king whose real character was masked made a monster of him joseph chenier tragedy was written under the influence of certain words scratched on the window of the projecting wing of the louvre looking toward the quay the words were as follows it was from this window that charles the ninth of execrable memory fired upon the french citizens it is well to inform future historians and all sensible persons that this portion of the louvre called today the old louvre which projects upon the quay and is connected with the louvre by a room called the hollow gallery while the great halls of the museum connect the louvre with the tuileries did not exist in the time of charles the ninth the greater part of the space where the frontage on the quay now stands and where the garden of the infanta is laid out was then occupied by the hotel de bourbon which belonged to and was the residence of the house of navarre it was absolutely impossible therefore for charles the ninth to fire from the louvre of Henri the second upon a boat full of huguenots crossing the river although at the present time the seine can be seen from its windows even if learned men and libraries did not possess maps of the louvre made in the time of charles the ninth on which it's then possible is clearly indicated the building itself refutes the error all the kings who cooperated in the work of erecting this enormous mass of buildings never failed to put their initials or some special monogram on the parts they had severally built now the part we speak of the venerable and now blackened wing of the louvre projecting on the quay and overlooking the garden of the infanta bears the monograms of henri the third and henri the fourth which are totally different from that of Henri the second who invariably joined his h to the two c's of catherine forming a d which by the by has constantly deceived superficial persons into fancying that the king put the initial of his mistress diane on great public buildings henri the fourth united the louvre with his own hotel de bourbon its garden and dependencies he was the first to think of connecting catherine de medici's palace of the tuileries with the louvre by his unfinished galleries the precious sculptures of which have been so cruelly neglected 
even if the map of paris and the monograms of Henri the third and Henri the fourth did not exist the difference of architecture is reputation enough to calumny the vermiculated stone copings of the hotel de la force mark the transition between what is called the architecture of the renaissance and that of Henri the third Henri the fourth and louis the thirteenth this archaeological digression continuing the sketches of old paris with which we began this history enables us to picture to our minds the then appearance of this other corner of the old city of which nothing now remains but Henri the fourth addition to the louvre which is admirable bas reliefs now being rapidly annihilated when the court heard that the queen was about to give an audience to theodore de Beers and chaudieu presented by admiral coligny all the courtiers who had the right of entrance to the reception hall hastened thither to witness the interview it was about six o'clock in the evening coligny had just supped and was using a toothpick as he came up the staircase of the louvre between the two reformers the practice of using a toothpick was so inveterate a habit with the admiral that he was seen to do it on the battlefield while planning the retreat distrust the admiral's toothpick the no of the connetable and catherine's yes was a court proverb of that day after the saint bartholomew the populace made a horrible jest on the body of coligny which hung for three days mon poisson by putting a grotesque toothpick into his mouth history has recorded this atrocious levity so petty an act done in the midst of that great catastrophe pictures the parisian populace which deserves the sarcastic gibe of boileau frenchman born malin created the guillotine a parisian of all time cracks jokes and makes lampoons before during and after the most horrible revolutions theodore de bez wore the dress of a courtier black silk stockings low shoes with straps across the instep tight breeches a black silk doublet with slashed sleeves and a small black velvet mantle over which lay an elegant white fluted ruff his beard was trimmed to a moustache and a vervule napled imperial and he carried a sword at his side and a cane in his hand. Whosoever knows the galleries of Versailles or the collections of Odieuve knows also his round, almost jovial face and lively eyes, surmounted by the broad forehead which characterized the writers and poets of that day. De Bez had what served him admirably an agreeable air and manner. In this he was a great contrast to Coligny of austere countenance and to the sour, bilious Chaudieu chose to wear on this occasion the robe and bands of a calvinist minister the scenes that happen in our day in the chamber of deputies and which no doubt happened in the convention will give an idea of how at this court at this epoch these men who six months later were to fight to the death in a war without quarter could meet and talk to each other with courtesy and even laughter birago who was coldly to advise the saint bartholomew and cardinal de Rotlerin, charged his servant besme not to miss the admiral now advanced to meet coligny virago saying with a smile well my dear admiral so you have really taken upon yourself to present these gentlemen from geneva perhaps you will call it a crime in me replied the admiral jesting whereas if you had done it yourself you would make a merit of it they say that the sir calvin is very ill remarked the cardinal de lorrain to theodore de bez i hope no one suspects us of giving him his broth now monsieur it would be too great a risk replied de bez maliciously the duc de guise who was watching chaudieu looked fixedly at his brother and birago who both were both taken aback by de bez's answer good god remarked the cardinal heretics are not diplomatic to avoid embarrassment the queen who was announced at this moment had arranged to remain standing during the audience she began by speaking to the connetable who had previously remonstrated with her vehemently on the scandal of the receiving messages from calvin you see my dear connetable she said they receive them without ceremony madame said the admiral approaching the queen these are two teachers of the new religion who have come to an understanding with calvin and who have his instructions as to conference on which the churches of france may be able to settle their differences this is a monsieur de bez to whom my wife is much attached 
said the king of Navarre, coming forward and taking the bears by the hand. And this is Chaudiot, said the Prince de Conte. My friend, the Duc de Guise, knows the soldier, he added, looking at Le Balfre. Perhaps you will now like to know the minister. The Gasconade made the whole court laugh, even Catherine. Faith, replied the Duc de Guise, I am enchanted to see a gal know so well how to choose his men and to employ them to the right sphere. One of your agents, he said to Chaudieu, actually endured the extraordinary question without dying and without confessing a single thing. I call myself brave. I don't know that I could have endured it as he did. Hmm, muttered Ambroise. You did not say a word when I pulled the javelin out of your face at Calais. Catherine, standing at the centre of the semicircle of the courtiers, made of honour kept silent. She was observing the two reformers try to penetrate their minds as, with the shrewd, intelligent glance of her black eyes, she studied them. One seems to be the scabbard, the other the blade, whispered Albert de Gondi in her ear. Well, gentlemen, said Catherine at last, unable to restrain a smile, has your master given you permission to unite in a public conference? which you will be converted by the arguments of the fathers of the church who are the glory of our state we have no master but the lord said chaudieu but uh, surely you will allow some little authority to the king of france said catherine smiling and much to the queen said the bears bowing low you will find continued the queen that our most submissive subjects are her chicks. Ah, madame, cried Coligny, we will indeed endeavour to make you a noble and peaceful kingdom. Europe has profited, alas, by our internal divisions. For the last fifty years she has had the advantage of one half of the French people being against the other half. Are we to sing anthems to the glory of heretics? said the Connetard brutally. No, but to bring them to repentance whispered the cardinal de lorraine in his ear we want to coax them by a little sugar do you know what i should have done under the late king said the connetable angrily i'd have called in the provost and hung these two knaves then and there on the gallows of the louvre well gentlemen who are the learned men whom you have selected as our opponents inquired the queen imposing silence on the connetable by a look Deplessis, Monet, and Theodore de Bez will speak on our side, replied Chaudieu. The court will doubtless go to Saint Germain, and as it would be improper that this colloquy should take place in a royal residence, we will have it in the little town of Poissy, said Catherine. Shall we be safe there, madame? Ah, replied the queen with a sort of naivety. You will surely know how to take precautions. The Admiral will arrange all that with my cousins, the Guises, and the Montmorency. The devil take them, cried the Connetable. I'll have nothing to do with them. How do you contrive to give such strength of character to your converts? said the Queen, leading Chaudier apart. The son of my furrier was actually sublime. We have faith, replied Chaudier. At this moment the hall presented a scene of animated groups, all discussing the question of the proposed assembly, which the few words said by the queen had already given the name of the colloquy of Poissy. Catherine glanced at Chaudieu and was able to say to him unheard, Yes, a new faith. Ah, oh, madame, if you were not blinded by our alliance with the court of Rome, you would see that we are returning to the true doctrines of Jesus Christ, who, recognizing the equality of souls, bestows upon all men equal rights on earth. Do you think yourself the equal of Calvin? asked the queen shrewdly. No, no, we are equals only in church. What, would you unbind the tie of the people to the throne? she cried. Then you are not only heretics, you are the revolutionists, rebels against obedience to the king, as you are against that to the pope. So saying, she left Chaudieu abruptly and returned to Théodore de Bez. I count on you, monsieur, she said. To conduct this colloquy in good faith. Take all the time you need. I had supposed, said Chaudieu to the Prince de Conte, the King of Navarre, and the Admiral Coligny, as they left the hall, 
a great state matter will be treated more seriously. Oh, you know very well what you want, exclaimed the prince de Conde, exchanging a sly look with Theodore de Bez. The prince now left his adherents to attend a rendezvous. This great leader of a party was also one of the most favoured gallants of the court. The two choice beauties of that day were even then striving with such desperate eagerness for his affections that one of them, the Margale de saint andre the wife of the future Tranville, gave him her beautiful estate of saint Valery, hoping to win him away from the Duchess de Guise, the wife of the man who tried to take his head on the scaffold. The Duchess, not being able to detach the Duc de Nemours from Mademoiselle de Rouen, fell in love, en attendant, with the leader of the reformers. What a contrast to Geneva, said Chaudier de Terre de Bez as they crossed the little bridge of the Louvre. The people here are certainly gayer than the Genevese. I don't see why they should be so treacherous, replied de Bez. To treachery oppose treachery, replied Chaudier, whispering the words of his companion's ear. I have saints in Paris on whom I rely. I intend to make Calvin a prophet. Christophe Le Camus shall deliver us from our most dangerous. The Queen Mother, for whom the poor devil endured this torture, has already, with a high hand, caused him to be appointed. And solicitors make better prosecutors than murderers. Don't you remember how Avenel betrayed the secrets of our first envoy? I know, Christophe said Chaudieu in a positive tone, as he turned away to leave the envoy from Geneva. End of section 16is in the public domain. Book one, fifteen. Compensation. A few days after the reception of Calvin's emissaries by the Queen, that is to say toward the close of the year, for the year then began at Easter, and the present calendar was not adopted until later in the reign of Charles the Ninth, Christophe reclined in an easy chair beside the fire in the large brown hall dedicated to family life that overlooked the river in his father's house, where the present drama was begun. His feet rested on a stool. His mother and Babette Lallier had just renewed the compresses, saturated with a solution brought by Ambroise Paré, who was charged by Catherine de' Medici to take care of the young man. Once restored to his family, Christophe became the object of the most devoted care. Babette, authorised by her father, came every morning and only left the Lecamus household at night. Christophe, the admiration of the apprentices, gave rise throughout the quarter to various tales which invested him with mysterious posy. He had borne the worst torture. The celebrated Ambroise Paré was employing all his skill to cure him. What great deed had he done to be thus treated? Neither Christophe nor his father said a word on the subject. Catherine, then all-powerful, was concerned in their silence as well as the Ponce de Conte. The constant visits of Paré, now chief surgeon of both the king and the house of Guise, whom the Queen Mother and the Lorraines allowed to treat a youth accused of heresy, strangely complicated an affair through which no one saw clearly. Moreover, the rector of saint pierre aux Boeuf came several times to visit the son of his church warden and these visits made the causes of Christophe's present condition still more unintelligible to his neighbours. The old syndic, who had his plan, gave evasive answers to his brother Furriers, the merchants of the neighbourhood, and to all friends who spoke to him of his son. Yes, I am very thankful to have saved him. Well, you know, it won't do to put your finger between the bark and the tree. My son touched fire and came near burning up my house. They took advantage of his youth. We burghers get nothing but shame and evil by frequenting the grandees. This affair decides me to t make a lawyer of Christophe. The practice of law will teach him to weigh his words and his acts. The young queen, who is now in Scotland, had a great deal to do with it, but then, to be sure, my son may have been imprudent. I have had cruel anxieties. All this may decide me to give up my business, 
I do not wish ever to go to court again. My son has had enough of the Reformation. It has cracked all his joints. If it had not been for Ambroise, I don't know what would have become of me. Thanks to these ambiguous remarks, and to the great discretion of such conduct, it was generally averred in the neighbourhood that Christophe had seen the error of his ways. Everybody thought it natural that the old syndic should wish to get his son appointed to the Parliament, and the rector's visits no longer seemed extraordinary. As the neighbours reflected on the old man's anxieties, they no longer thought, as they would otherwise have done, that his ambition was inordinate. The young lawyer, who had lain helpless for months on the bed which his family made up for him in the old hall, was now for the last week able to rise and move about by the aid of crutches. Babette's love and his mother's tenderness had deeply touched his heart, while they had him helpless in their hands, lectured him severely on religion. Président de Thieu paid his godson a visit during which he showed himself most fatherly. Christophe, being now solicitor of the Parliament, must of course, he said, be Catholic. His oath would bind him to that, and the President, who assumed not to doubt of his godson's orthodoxy, ended his remarks by saying with great earnestness, My son, you have been cruelly tried. I am myself ignorant of the reasons which made the Monsieur de Guise treat you thus. I advise you in future to live peacefully, without entering into the troubles of the times. For the favour of the king and queen will not be shown to the makers of revolt. You are not important enough to play fast and loose with the king as the Guises do. If you wish to be some day councillor to the parliament, remember that you cannot obtain that noble office, unless by real and serious attachment to the royal cause. Nevertheless, neither President Tetu's visit, nor the seductions of Babette, nor the urgency of his mother were sufficient to shake the constancy of the martyr of the Reformation. Christophe held to his religion all the more because he had suffered for it. "'My father will never let me marry a heretic,' whispered Babette in his ear. Christophe answered only by tears, which made the young girl silent and thoughtful. Old Lecamu maintained his paternal and magisterial dignity. He observed his son and said little. The stern old man, after recovering his dear Christophe, was dissatisfied with himself. He repented the tenderness he had shown for this only son, but he admired him secretly. At no period of his life did the syndic pull more wires to reach his ends, for he saw the field ripe for the harvest so painfully sown, and he wanted to gather the whole of it. Some days before the morning of which we write, he had had, being alone with Christophe, a long conversation with him in which he endeavoured to discover the secret reason of the young man's resistance. Christophe, who was not without ambition, betrayed his faith in the Ponce de Conde. The generous promise of the prince, who of course was only exercising his profession of, of prince, remained graven on his heart. Little did he think that Conde had sent him mentally to the devil in Orléans, muttering, A Gascon would have understood me better, when Christophe called out a touching farewell as the prince passed the window of his dungeon. But besides this sentiment of admiration for the prince, Christophe had also conceived a profound reverence for the great queen, who had explained to him by a single look the necessity which compelled her to sacrifice him, and who during his agony had given him an illimitable promise in a single tear. During the silent months of his weakness, as he lay there waiting for recovery, he thought over each event at Blois and Orléans. He weighed, one might almost say in spite of himself, the relative worth of these two protections. He floated between the Queen and the Prince. He had certainly served Catherine more than he had served the Reformation then a young man both heart and mind would naturally incline toward the queen, less because she was a queen than because she was a woman. Under such circumstances a man will always hope more from a woman than from a man. I sacrifice myself for her, what will she do for me? This question Christophe put to himself almost involuntarily, as he remembered the tone in which he had said the words, povero mio. It is difficult to believe how egotistical a man can become when he lies on a bed of sickness. Everything, even the exclusive devotion of which he is the object, 
drives him to think only of himself. By exaggerating in his own mind the obligation which the Prince de Conde was under to him, he had come to expect that some office would be given to him at the court of Navarre. Still new to the world of political life, he forgot its contending interests and the rapid march of events, which control and force the hand of all leaders of parties. He forgot it the more because he was practically a prisoner in solitary confinement on his bed in that old brown room. Each party is necessarily ungrateful while the struggle lasts. When it triumphs, it has too many persons to reward not to be ungrateful still. Soldiers submit to this ingratitude, but their leaders turn against the new master and decide they have acted and suffered like equals for so long. Christophe, who alone remembered his sufferings, felt himself already among the leaders of the Reformation by the fact of his martyrdom. His father, that old fox of commerce, so shrewd, so perspicacious, ended by divining the secret thought of his son. Consequently, all his manoeuvres were now based on the natural expectancy to which Christophe had yielded himself. "'Wouldn't it be a fine thing,' he had said to Babette in presence of the family a few days before his interview with his son, "'to be the wife of a councillor of the Parliament, who would be called Madame.' "'You are crazy, compère,' said Lallier. "'Where would you get ten thousand crowns income from landed property, which a councillor must have, according to law, and from whom could you buy the office? No one but the Queen Mother and Regent could help your son in Parliament, and I'm afraid he's too tainted with a new opinion for that.' "'What would you pay to see your daughter the wife of a councillor? "'Ah, you want to look into my purse, shrewd head,' said Lallier councillor to the parliament the words worked powerfully in christophe's brain some time after this conversation one morning when christophe was gazing at the river and thinking of the scene which began this history of the ponce de conde chaudieu la renaudie of his journey to blois in short the whole story of his hopes his father came and sat beside him scarcely conceding a joyful thought beneath a serious manner my son he said after what passed between you and the leaders of the tumult of Amboise, they owe you enough to make the care of your future incumbent on the house of Navarre. Yes, replied Christophe. Well, continued his father, I have asked the permission to buy a legal practice for you in the province of Bern. Our good friend Paray undertook to present the letters which I wrote on your behalf to the Prince de Conde and the Queen of Navarre. Here, read the answer of Monsieur de Pibur vice-chancellor of navarre to the sieur lacamou syndic of the guild of fourriers monseigneur le prince de conde desires me to express his regret that he cannot do what you ask for his late companion in the tower of saint agnon whom he perfectly remembers and to whom meanwhile he offers the place of gendarme in his company which will put your son in the way of making his mark as a man of courage which he is the Queen of Navarre awaits an opportunity to reward the Sieur Christophe, and will not fail to take advantage of it. And upon which, Monsieur le Syndic, we pray God to have you in his keeping. Pibrac at Narac, Chancellor of Navarre. Narac, Pibrac, crack! cried Babette. There is no confidence to be placed in Gascons. They think only of themselves. Old Lecamus looked at his son, smiling scornfully. They proposed to put on horseback a poor boy whose knees and ankles were shattered for their six. They proposed to put on horseback a poor boy whose knees and ankles were shattered for their six, cried the mother. What a wicked jest! I shall never see you a councillor of Navarre, said his father. I wish I knew what Queen Catherine would do for me, if I made a claim upon her, said Christophe cast down by the prince's answer. "'She made you no promise,' said the old man. "'But I am certain that she will never mock you like these others. She will remember your sufferings. Still, how can the queen make a councillor of the parliament out of a Protestant burgher?' "'But Christophe has not abjured,' cried Babette. "'He can very well keep his private opinion secret.' "'The Prince de Conde would be less distasteful of a councillor of the parliament,' said Lallier. "'Well, what do you say, Christophe?' urged Babette. 
you are counting without the queen replied the young lawyer a few days after this rather bitter disillusion an apprentice brought christophe the following laconic little missive chaudieu wishes to see his son let him come in cried christophe oh my sacred matter said the minister embracing him have you recovered from your sufferings yes thanks to Paré. thanks rather to god who gave you the strength to endure the torture but what is this i hear have you allowed them to make you a solicitor have you taken the oath of fidelity surely you will not recognize that prostitute the roman catholic and apostolic church my father wished it but ought we not to leave fathers and mothers and wives and children at all all for the sacred cause of calvinism nay must we not suffer all things ah christophe calvin the great calvin the whole party the whole world the future counts upon your courage and the grandeur of your soul we want your life it is a remarkable fact in the mind of man that the most devoted spirits even while devoting themselves build romantic hopes upon their perilous enterprises when the prince the soldier and the minister had asked christophe under the bridge to convey to catherine the treaty which if discovered would in all probability cost him his life the lad had relied on his nerve upon chance upon the powers of his mind and confident in such hopes he bravely nay audaciously put himself between those terrible adversaries the guises and catherine during the torture he still kept saying to himself i shall come out of it it is only pain but when this second and brutal demand die we want your life was made upon a boy who was still almost helpless scarcely recovered from his late torture and clinging all the more to life because he had just seen death so near it was impossible for him to launch into further illusions christophe answered quietly what is it now to fire a pistol courageously as stuart did on me now on whom the duc de guise a murder a vengeance have you forgotten the hundred gentlemen massacred on the scaffold at amboise a child who saw that butchery the little daubigny cried out they have slaughtered france you could receive the blows of others and give none that is the religion of the gospel said christophe if you imitate the catholics in their cruelty of what good is it to reform the church oh christophe you have made you a lawyer and now you argue said chaudieu no my friend replied the young man but parties are ungrateful and you will be both you and yours nothing more than puppets of the bourbons christophe if you could hear galvin you would know how we weigh him like gloves the bourbons are the gloves we are the hand read that said christophe giving chaudieu pibrac's letter containing the answer of the prince de conte oh my son you are ambitious you can no longer make the sacrifice of yourself i pity you with those fine words chaudier turned and left him some days after that scene the lallier family and the lecamus family were gathered together in honour of the formal betrothal of christophe and babette in the old brown hall from which christophe's bed had been removed for he was now able to drag himself about and even mount the stairs without his crutches it was nine o'clock in the evening and the company were awaiting amboise pare the family notary sat before a table on which lay various contracts the furrier was selling his house and business to his head clerk who was to pay down forty thousand francs for the house and then mortgage it as a security for the payment of the goods for which however he paid twenty thousand francs on account le camus was also buying for his son a magnificent stone house built by philibert de romé in the rue saint pierre au boeuf which he gave to christophe as a marriage portion he also took two hundred thousand francs from his own fortune and lallier gave as much more for the purchase of a fine seigneurial manor in picardy the price of which was five hundred thousand francs as this manor was a tenure for the crown it was necessary to obtain letters patent 
called rescriptions granted by the king, and also to make payment to the crown of considerable feudal dues. The marriage had been postponed until this royal favour was obtained. Though the burghers of Paris had lately acquired the right to purchase manors, the wisdom of the privy council had been exercised in putting certain restrictions on the sale of those estates which were dependencies of the crown, and the one which old Lecamus had had in his eye for the last dozen years was among them. Bomboise was pledged to bring the royal ordinance that evening, and the old furrier went and came from the hall to the door in a state of impatience which showed how great his long-repressed ambition had been. Amboise at last appeared. "'My old friend,' cried a surgeon in an agitated manner, with a glance at the supper-table, "'let me see your linen. Good. Oh, you must have wax candles. Quick, quick, get out your best things.' "'Why, what is it all about?' asked the rector at St. pierre au "'The Queen Mother and the young King are coming to sup with you,' replied the surgeon. They are only waiting for an old councillor who agreed to sell his place to Christophe, and with whom Monsieur de Thieu has concluded a bargain. Don't appear to know anything. I have escaped from the Louvre to warn you. In a second the whole family were astir. Christophe's mother and Babette's aunt bustled about with the celerity of housekeepers, suddenly surprised. But in spite of the apparent confusion into which the news had thrown the entire family, the precautions were promptly made with an activity that was nothing short of marvellous. Christophe, amazed and confounded by such a favour, was speechless, gazing mechanically at what went on. "'The Queen and King here in the house,' said the old mother. "'The Queen!' repeated Babette. "'What must we say and do?' In less than an hour all was changed. The hall was decorated. The supper-table sparkled. Presently the noise of horses sounded in the street. The light of torches carried by the horsemen of the escort brought all the burghers of the neighbourhood to their windows. The noise soon subsided and the escort rode away, leaving the Queen Mother and her son, King Charles the Ninth, Charles de Gondi, now Grand Master of the Wardrobe and Governor of the King, Monsieur de Thieu, Binard, Secretary of State, the old councillor, and two pages under the arcade before the door. "'My worthy people,' said the Queen as she entered. The king, my son, and I have come to sign the marriage contract of the son of my furrier, but only on condition that he remains a Catholic. A man must be Catholic to enter Parliament. He must be a Catholic to own land which derives from the crown. He must be a Catholic if he would sit at the king's table. That is so. Is it not, Pinard? The Secretary of State entered and showed the letters patent. "'If we are not all Catholics,' said the little king, "'Pinar will throw these papers into the fire. "'But we are all Catholics here, I think,' he continued, "'casting his somewhat haughty eyes over the company. "'Yes, sire,' replied Christophe, "'bending his injured knees with difficulty "'and kissing the hand which the king held out to him. "'Queen Catherine stretched out her hand to Christophe, "'and raising him hastily, drew him aside into a corner, "'saying in a low voice, "'Oh, sir!' My lad, no evasions here. Are you playing above board now? Yes, madame, he answered, won by the dazzling reward and the honour done him by the grateful queen. Very good, monsieur le Camus. The king, my son, and I permit you to purchase the office of the good man Grosselet, councillor of the parliament, here present. Young man, you will follow, I hope, in the steps of your predecessor. De two advanced and said, I will answer for him, madame. Very well. Draw up the deed notary, said Pinard. Inasmuch as the king our master does us the favour to sign my daughter's marriage contract, cried Lallier, I will pay the whole price of the manor. The ladies may sit down, said the young king graciously. As a wedding present to the bride, I remit, with my mother's consent, all my dues and rights in the manor. Old Lecamus and Lallier fell on their knees and kissed the king's hand. "'What do you say? What quantities of money these burghers have?' whispered de Gondi in his ear. The young king laughed. "'As their highnesses are so kind,' said old Lecamus, "'will they permit me to present to them my successor, and ask them to continue to him the royal patent of Fourier to the majesties?' "'Let us see him,' said the king. Lecamus led forward his successor, 
who was livid with fear. "'If my mother consents, we will now sit down to table,' said the little king. Old Lecamus had bethought himself of presenting to the king a silver goblet which he had bought of Benvenuto Cellini when the latter stayed in Paris at the Hôtel de Nelle. This treasure of art had cost the Fourier no less than two thousand crowns. "'Oh, my dear mother, see this beautiful work!' cried the young king, lifting the goblet by its stem. "'It was made in Florence,' replied Catherine. "'Pardon me, madame,' cried Lecamus. "'It was made in Paris by a Florentine. "'All that is made in Florence would belong to your majesty. "'That which is made in France is the king's.' "'I accept it, my good man,' cried Charles the Ninth, "'and it shall henceforth be my particular drinking cup.' It is beautiful enough, said the queen, examining the masterpiece, to be included among the crown jewels. Well, Maitre Ambroise, she whispered in the surgeon's ear with a glance at Christophe, have you taken good care of him? Will he walk again? He will run, replied the surgeon, smiling. Ah, you have cleverly made him a renegade. Ha! said the queen with a levity for which she has been blamed though it was only on the surface. The church won't stand still for want of one monk. The supper was gay, the queen thought Babette pretty, and in the regal manner which was natural to her she slipped upon the girl's finger a diamond ring, which compensated in value for the goblet bestowed upon the king. Charles the Ninth, who afterwards became rather too fond of these invasions of burgher homes, supped with a good appetite. Then at a word from his new governor, who, it is said, was instructed to make him forget the virtuous teachings of Cipierre. He obliged all the men present to drink so deeply that the queen, observing that the gaiety was about to become too noisy, rose to leave the room. As she rose, Christophe, his father, and the two women took torches and accompanied her to the shop door. There Christophe ventured to touch the queen's wide sleeve, and to make her a sign that he had something to say. Catherine stopped, made a gesture to the father and the two women to leave her, and said, turning to Christophe, "'What is it?' "'It may serve you to know, madame,' replied Christophe, whispering in her ear, "'that the Duc de Guise is being followed by assassins.' "'You are a loyal subject,' said Catherine, smiling, "'and I shall never forget you.' She held out to him her hand, so celebrated for its beauty, first ungloving it, which was indeed a mark of favour, so much so that Christophe then and there became altogether royalist as he kissed that adorable hand. So they mean to rid me of that bully without my having a finger in it, thought she as she replaced her glove. Then she mounted her mule and returned to the Louvre, attended by her two pages. Christophe went back to the supper-table, but was thoughtful and gloomy even while he drank. The fine, austere face of Ambroise Paré seemed to reproach him for his apostasy, but subsequent events justified the manoeuvres of the old syndic. Christophe would certainly not have escaped the massacre of saint Bartholomew. His wealth and his landed estates would have made him a mark for the murderers. History has recorded the cruel fate of the wife of Lallier's successor, the beautiful woman, whose naked body hung by the hair for three days from one of the buttresses of the Pont au Change. Babette trembled as she thought that she, too, might have endured the same treatment if Christophe had continued a Calvinist, for such became the name of the reformers. Calvin's personal ambition was thus gratified, though not until after his death. Such was the origin of the celebrated parliamentary house of Le Camus. Talamon de Rio is in error when he states that they came originally from Picardy. It is only true that the Lecamus family found it for their interest in other days to date from the time the old Fourier bought their principal estate, which, as we have said, was situated in Picardy. Christophe's son, who succeeded him under Louis the Thirteenth, was the father of the rich President Lecamus, who built in the reign of Louis the Fourteenth that magnificent mansion which shares with the Hôtel Lambert the admiration of Parisians and foreigners, and was assuredly one of the finest buildings in Paris. It may still be in the Rue Torigny, though at the beginning of the Revolution it was pillaged as having belonged to Monsieur de Juigne, the Archbishop of Paris. 
All the decorations were then destroyed, and the tenants who lodged there have greatly damaged it. Nevertheless, this palace, which is reached through the old house in the Rue de la Pelleterie, still shows the noble results obtained in former days by the spirit of family. It may be doubted whether modern individualism, brought about by the equal division of inheritances, will ever raise such noble buildings. End of section 17